those lines are hard to move. Uh, generally industrial, you have a long-term lease. You still have the expansion and retrenching problem that you have in the office space. Uh, a successful tenant's going to eventually need to get more space, and an unsuccessful one will, will be gone. Um, and generally there's no repairs. You know, depending on the lease, there can be roof foundation, exterior walls, depending on how the negotiations go. Sometimes those are left with the landlord. And on this one, the tenant pays, pays the cap. So this is a really a nice one for retirement because uh, the tenant's improving your property, you're not making repairs, uh, the tenant does their own, you know, unclogs their own toilets, you know, depending on how you do the lease, maybe doing their own roof, and in the mail you get a net check. And, and that's always fun to get. And then here is uh, retail. This is a, a 450 unit apartment building. I actually brokered, helped on the broker of the sale of that. It was for $24 million. Uh, we sold it to SCI, which was a uh, uh, private uh, real estate tick sponsor. They immediately turned around and resold it for $25 million at a 7.72% cap rate. Um, the thing with apartments, the average stay is about 12 months. So if you get a tenant in an apartment, they're expected to stay about a year. The other thing is the landlord does all the repairs and maintenance. Uh, the landlord pays all the common area expenses. It's very management intensive. So when you look at it as a, a class of real estate that you have to work with, it's actually a, a pretty poor class of real estate in that you're paying all the repairs, you're doing all the expenses, it's, people are constantly moving, turnover, management intensive. Um, but the beauty of it is it's generally easy to fill a vacancy particularly here on the coast of California. Uh, whereas you can have office vacancies for years. You can have industrial vacancies and retail vacancies for years. That's very uncommon that, to have that in, in apartments. Although in periods of overbuilding that happens. Uh, so there's the list of the, uh, the properties that you wrote down and we looked at the risk. Uh, what I'd like you to do now is number them from one to six and what you think is the reward from those properties. Which investment class typically provides the best reward, number one, to the, the class of property that returns the, generally returns the less reward for investment? I'll give you a minute to do that. generally returns a higher um, uh, IRR to the investor. <laughs> Incidentally, did everybody get my business card? Yeah. Yeah. I'm only a phone call away, and if we have to meet face to face, it's a, it's a pleasant drive. And I gave out, I think hopefully you got two of them. I'm going to ask you to hand one out to somebody you know that uh, could be in need of a real estate attorney in the future. All right? So there we are. It's exactly what you'd expect, right? <laughs> Those classes of land, of uh, Real estate investment that have the highest risk also have the highest reward in general. If you get land in the path of progress, I don't know any real estate investment that can beat that. If you pick up a hotel just before an economic boom, uh, you're going to see a tremendous return on your investment. The retail, office, industrial, and the poorest return you can get in real estate is on residential. Uh, you know, and, you know, I think. You know, seasoned investor, you first get in and you buy a house, well, the house is built, maybe you can improve it a little bit, but really you're relying on inflation and other factors to add value to that. Whereas in some of these other classes, you can put in uh, some creative uh, work and reposition the property and create value. 
And that's pretty much the little thing that I prepared, just to kind of give you an overview. Uh, at this time, I'll take questions if there are any. On anything in general. Give us your take on this, uh, this uh, private funding law, this SAFE Act. Uh, it's, it was highly overdue. Uh, it was designed to protect people that are buying homes. Uh, and what it does is it requires people originating loans to get a license. So what we saw is mortgage brokers hiring uneducated, unskilled people. Uh, you know, I don't even, I guess they have to be 18, right? Uh, maybe not. And they had no background at all in real estate. They had no understanding of finance. They had no knowledge of mortgage. And they're out there knocking on people's doors and getting them into loans and getting them into some pretty bad ones too. So the intent of it, I think, is really a good thing. Uh, California, um, there are nine states that have, um, most states have gone with the Federal Act. They figure the feds have done it, it's good enough for us. Of course, we're in California, so we have to do our own thing. And uh, you know, that's, that's being uh, finalized now. Uh, but basically, people originating loans are going to have to be licensed. And they've set up a national database for people, uh, where, you know, they'll track people, just like they do on SEC licenses. Um, you know, it's, they're going to have to have a federal, it'll be in the federal database and have passed the test. I think it's a great thing. The test itself is not that hard. For anyone who knows the mortgage industry, will pass that test fine. For somebody who's uneducated, dropped out of high school, um, doesn't understand uh, finance, it might be difficult. And that's the way it should be. I think the net result of it is going to be uh, in the next surge, because there will be less licensed mortgage brokers and originators, that um, you know, they're going to be, you know, they're going to probably be able to channel loans a little more effectively. What type of license is that? Just a real estate license? Well, you can do it through the Department of Corporations if you want, or you can do it through the Department of Real Estate, your choice, but it's basically a mortgage uh, originator's license. It means you've got to understand some of the basics of, of mortgage lending. So uh, I have a real estate license, uh -huh. but I have to get a new license. Yeah, so you just go on the website, you put in your name, your license, boom, you're in, you go take a test, and then you get a writer, it's like a writer on your license. Yes. I, I guess well, that the specific question then is, if it's, it's an individual just doing a uh, uh, seller's financing, or let's say a self-directed IRA writing a note for somebody, are they in fact going to fall in that category? Because I've heard that there might be some stipulations or exceptions for that seller finance property. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I've got to imagine it's not going to apply to seller financing properties. So you know, what it's really question. what it's really designed to prevent is that the unscrupulous, uneducated individual that's going out and uh, writing loans and making a $25,000 brokerage fee for a you know, 400000 residential loan. That's what it's really designed to do. I don't think it's going to impact seller, seller financing on sellers, uh, on property that sellers sold. So I don't know. I, don't, I can't say for 100%. Yeah, and I, and I won't say that. You know, that's the kind of thing that you go and you research and you make sure you're, you're correct before you somebody relies on what you say. But I, I, you know, I would, you know, it's not, that's not what it's intended, right. intended to. So I heard that was self debate whether that would fall into the exception category because that wasn't the intent and whether they were going to set some kind of rule related to a uh, number of times. Like if you're doing X deals or fewer, one per yeah. year or something. Yeah, well, probably they do get to that point, you probably design on the IRS rules, whether you're a dealer or not. 